data and the web. And you could cover at least an hour in just talking about closure. So what I, the, the approach that I want to take is kind of, uh, I don't want to dig in and show you everything about the language. I just want to show you a couple parts. I don't want to go through a lot of code. Uh, let you see it in action. That's kind of the plan. I've got a survey up here that we're going to use the data from. So if you go fill this out, it's just like five questions. Just as that. If you also could fill it out on your phone and on your computer, we're going to do some looking at where the data is coming from. So <coughs> there's nothing personal about it. Anyways. Of course, you can, you can skip answer. All right.
take apart and fix or change a part of it. So he compares it to this idea of a knitted castle, right? What happens if you want to change the knitted castle? You, you can't without destroying the whole thing. Uh, whereas with Legos, if, if it's built of simple parts, composable parts, you can you can change it and yeah. So listen to him talk about it. It's more interesting. So I'll give you a brief intro. I, I'll explain why it's compelling to me. And uh, there was a in the I was looking at the submissions. There were over 130 PHP talks submitted, and I think in the other lane category there were 10. So I felt it was a little out of balance. But so I may not I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on closure, but uh, I'm going to give you some of my experience and uh, I just want to share. So I'm not going to cover all the features. And I'm not going to try and convince you it's the best for everything. Uh, I think it's it's pretty easy to understand that, that there, there isn't a one programming language to solve all the problems. And this is just a little bit of speaking advice. Someone uh, Ben Ornstein and Craig Lindera said that. If your, if your talk could have been read in a blog post, you have failed as a presenter. So I'm going to do some stuff that's live, and we'll risk a little bit by doing that, but uh, hopefully it'll be better than a blog post. So this guy, John James Turnbull, he used to be a doctor, and he wrote this really good intro called Just Enough Closure. You can Google for it. It's pretty interesting you want a good place to start. So it's created by Rich. It's a Lisp. That's one of the unique characteristics. Another is that it's a functional language. And in the beginning, he designed it with concurrency in mind. It, it also is targeting not just the JVM, but also the CLR and uh, JavaScript. So Lisp. Who's familiar with Lisp? Uh, some of the benefits of, of Lisp, Lisp, the, Lisp stands for List Processing. And some of the ideas in it, you have a REPL where you can program live, you can create macros. And there was a quote, I've got a link to some Paul Graham quotes about Lisp, but I, this, this one's not on there, and I don't have a source, so take that as you can. But Guy Steele said that if you give a man Fortran, he has Fortran. by virtue of the macros. So you can see this prefix notation is uh, a little bit different than your normal infix notation. And the, the link at the bottom, meeting the averages, talks about Paul Graham and his startup that uh, used Lisp as their secret button. So that's one aspect of closure. Another is being a functional program. So immutable data structures are paramount. And this idea of Avoiding, avoiding change, trying not to change state, uh, and also giving you mathematics. So if you're, you know, comfortable with you parentheses around, around your maps, uh, it looks a lot, it looks similar. And closure does concurrency. I don't really do a lot with concurrency, but the way that it was built. Do you have a question? No, they're just taking the survey. Gotcha. Uh, as far as concurrency goes, if you're familiar with Go and Go blocks. They inspired a part of uh, closure called uh, a library called CoreAC. They also support software transaction memory. I can't really go into too much detail about those. But uh, <coughs> what's, what's interesting about closure is that the, there's the core language, and you can add, adding on this concept of Go blocks is, um, can be added on a, a library. Uh, it doesn't have to be baked into the core. So that was another idea of the design. You can also, there's also logic programming. An additional library that can work on top. So yeah, the JVM, JavaScript, CLR, and it wasn't it wasn't really designed to have just for syntax. It was, you know, uh, languages like Ruby. The one of the driver one of the drivers was let's make it really programmer friendly. Uh, Rich's drive behind this was again solving making software and large software systems. So you have various IDs, the, the community, a lot of people use Emacs. There's a plugin for IntelliJ, there's one for Eclipse. Light table is kind of this new uh, 
ID built specifically for closure, and I use Vim. There's some pain points to it, but it works as well. So we're going to go to the, to the demo, and I'm going to just kind of walk through and let you know a little bit about the data types. So with, with closure, there's a build tool called Mining Wheel, which is a German word that I'm sure I'm pronouncing somewhat incorrectly. But when you can download and install it and then just let run line REPL and it will give you a closure REPL. Which So here I'm in a REPL, if, you, if you're familiar, you know, you can type Python or Node and you get an interactive prompt, similar. There's a, at the foundation, so functional programming is kind of based around functions, right? So if I want to add one and one, that's what it looks like. Is that larger maybe? You're, you're missing the left call out of this. So you saw the so you have uh, you can also look at the types. So if I want to inspect the type of plus it's a Java class. I can also look at the source of it. I can type. And so this is a function. Defn is a macro that creates a function. The first the first line is a doc string. Which is really handy. Uh, I can also check the docs. And uh, you can get that. So that's handy to have those right, right there. Let's look at collections. And if I need to, if someone needs me to stop, slow down, let me know. There's a, there's a bunch of more interesting demos that I want to do at the end, so uh, just kind of speed through it. Stop me though if you, if you do have questions. Cool. Uh, so list processing, we're processing lists, so what does a list look like? I can do a list such as one, two, three, and I'm just evaluating the list. I can, I can quote it with a single quote in the front and it just returns code unevaluated which is important here. And you'll see you'll see that a lot through this. I can also I can also just say one, two, two, three. And that's also a list. What about the quote? Oh with the quote. So if I do this, I've got it. Because because what I'm doing here, if you notice, if I if I call this, then I'm I should probably explain a little bit about functions first. The first argument in the list is the function. The rest are arguments to the function. So I'm calling the list function and giving three arguments there at the top. So right here, I'm calling the one function and trying to give it arguments. So it doesn't take arguments, right? So uh, I can also, so let's say I want to add to a list. I can conjoin and and so so the first argument to conjoin is a list, right? So to this list, conjoin something else. So let's let's add four to it and add at the beginning because so so lists are going to be a little bit different than vectors, and you'll see conjoin. The way that you add to something is different based on what it is. So uh, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but since I'm explaining it, let's conjoin. Let's just look at vectors. So I can do a vector. Uh, to, to create a vector, I can also do I can pass it a list. So there's your vector, and what I can do here now is let's conjoin to that the number. Of and then at the end. So this is kind of like when you push onto an array, you get it at the end. But uh, with lists, you don't you don't have the ability to, to choose the nth value like you do in vectors. 
So it just added it conjoins to the front. So that's a little different. You can but you can say first. Give me the rest of that, and that's two and three. So that's kind of how we think of, of the list: is there's the first one, then there's the rest. If I try and do the last, oh, sorry, I had a uh, I and I can do <coughs> yes. Yeah, so so I, and I've done vectors. If I if we look at so I can also just do a vector like this. So commas, there's no commas in here. You're used to seeing commas in your in your vectors. They're just treated as white space and closure. I can call int on this. And let's get the second element, or index of two, which is actually the third element. If I if I look for four, I get but if I call it on a, on a list, then I get down. Questions about this or vectors? Okay. Let's look at set. So a set is a is a is a, is a list where every element in the is unique. So a set I can call set and pass it a list. So there's three elements in it. If I if I were to pass this, it would only give me the unique ones in it. With a with a set, you often want to know is something in a set or not. So you can use contains. And let's see if it contains false. You can also, with a set, you can you can retrieve the element from the set. Uh, 
Uh, so if I want to add to this, use so so here's here's something as we're so you use a source to add to the map and, and let's say, let's add uh, from. how we add, we can also, so if I take that now, I'm going to disassociate from it, the, take the name out, there we go. So they, there's some really nice ways of working with maps. What's, what's interesting, so this is, with the data being immutable though, I'm passing, I'm passing it to the function and it's returning something new. It's not modifying the map. It's returning a new map based on the old one. And uh, yeah, everything becomes a function of the last thing. So we sorry, let's let's define a function. Oh so so vars, let's say I want to define um, let's define cam. M is <coughs> map. So I, if I evaluate cam, I get the map. Now if I if I associate, let's say I want to dissociate the uh, let's say I want to take my dissociate my name. That's that. But if I evaluate cam, I still have my name. You see that? So we're we're not changing the data. It's not mutating. It's still there. You you work with the if, if I need if I need the representation of me without a name, then it's a function of the original me. And so let's define a function. And so with the function, we're going to call it. This is really basic, but we're just going to call it add some text. And it's going to take a string. I'm going to add a doc string in here. This function takes an, a string and adds and some. It's a pretty useful function. So the uh, you don't have to have a doc string. <coughs> going to take a string which will represent as s as the argument and then so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take str which is this the string function so this will concatenate I'm going to concatenate s with and some so I want to say so if I just want to evaluate add some text to West. There we go. So that's that's a function, and, and you can get. You know, they obviously are a lot more complex than this. And we'll look at a couple of examples. Does anybody have any questions for me? Keep going. These are these are the really the foundational elements of it. Of closure is the data types and functions. So you said those are just definition comments at the top. Uh, this function takes a string. It's a doc, yeah, so let's let's check it out. So I want to look at the doc, the documentation for this. There it returns my definition, like my documentation, which is which is handy because uh, let's look at a SOS. Doc SOS. This is the doc string from it. It uh, when applied to a map returns a new map of the same hashed sorted type. That contains the map. So, really nice when you're working, you want to understand what the function does. Yeah, let's, let's, let's keep rolling into... Okay. So, a source um, will take what, a, a, a vector or a, a map? Um, so, it will take either, right? A vector or a map? Um, how do you... How do you do the uh, the define for that? Do you just Let's define it two different ways? Yeah, so you have you can do multiple queries. Um, 
don't have a good example prepared, but let's look at a SOS. In here you have the, the arc list. And okay, so here's so in, in Aries, so here's here's there's the function. And this is the first one. If you can get so it'll take a map and a key and a value. And if it sees that you have a map, a key, and a value, then it will do this. If it has also a list of keys and values with it, then it will perform this. And that's multi-arity uh, functions, which you end up writing a lot of these because you may want to handle things differently. Uh, so, yeah. All right, presentation. Okay, so here's the demo. Oh, no, it's not demo yet. So in, in building web applications, Closure Script has, has been really hot lately. It's, it's kind of bleeding edge still. Is, who's familiar with React? You know, that's kind of a buzzing framework. There's a there's wrappers for React, Home, and Reagent are a couple of them. And do they originally uh, they were getting better performance with Home than React because of the immutable <coughs> types. And they were different the, the DOM. Uh, there's now immutable JS things to kind of give you immutable data types in JavaScript too. But, uh, so that's cool. You, you can also build, so that, that's kind of the, what people are using for the front end or just pure JavaScript, like if you wanted to build pure, pure JavaScript front end or something. And on the back end there's Ring, which is a lot like that we just SGI or Rack. Um, and we'll, do, we'll look at something that looks a lot like Python's Flask app. That's the, the survey. There's a, there's a lot of libraries for doing data analysis, too. You can, you can write your stuff with like pure closure. Encanter is kind of like pandas in Python. Is anyone familiar with that? So a statistical library with, that gives you data sets. Um, if you need Hadoop, there's a... Hadoop has an abstraction called Cascading, and Cascalog is a logic programming wrapper around Cascading. And Spark, there's some libraries for Spark. Yeah, so let's code. Here's the plan for the code. We have a web application. It's not it's not a complex web application, but all it's going to do is serve a form, and then it's going to have a handler that handles the form request. I realize we could have totally done this in PHP just the same, but I just want to give you an idea of what it looks like on the back end. Then we're going to look at the data that everyone submitted. It's closure. And so 
So we're just defining a project, which is a macro. And these are arguments to the function to find project. And actually, just for fun, uh, let's look at the source for def project. Did you practice this? Oh, no source found. There we go. There we go. Won't go. Won't go. Okay, so this is it. This is just a really basic web app. I'm going to use a library called Composure for routing. This NLive is for browser or for HTML templating. We use the JDBC to connect to Postgres, and then there's some Ring middleware. Ring is the uh, is the is handling the request and the response. And this is mostly for the anti-forgery, so that we can use that. So. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to define, this is just a definition of, I'm defining DB, and it's just taking a map. It needs Postgres, the, the, uh, there's the uh, location, the username and password. And then I'm going to define some keys, and this is going to help me interact with the database. So those are the keys. You probably filled out some of those forms, or some of those things. And then HTML, so when I require something, I can, I can give it a shorter name to reference here. So HTML is just, uh, that's what I'm, I'm calling the def template in the HTML namespace. You'll notice at the very top, we have the Open West Survey Handler. That's the namespace we're working in right now. And so this, the way code is organized in namespaces, you have the namespace and all these functions, and you access them through the namespace. So def template, uh, and the, 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 the template is called form page. That's how we'll reference it. It takes a path to the HTML uh, to the HTML file, and then you pass in a request. And this, all it does, it's it's kind of tricky. It uses CSS selectors to take a static HTML file and inject something, compile it, injects it, and then serves it. So, well, I don't want to dig into that too much, but. It's kind of a clever way of doing it because I can I can have my designers build the whole page and then I can just go through and, and blow out the parts of it that I need to fill in. Again, I, I'm not necessarily advocating that approach, but it's kind of clever. So this is the survey handler. Well, let's let's start from the back. So so when 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 the request comes in, the app is the main handler. It's, it's our main function. It, it wraps the defaults and then I have. Uh, then it passes them to the routes. The routes get it, and if if it's a get, which is when you load the page in the first, you get form page, which is that function that where we define the template, and that's why it serves the static HTML file. Post is going to serve use the survey handler, and then there's one a function for not found. So here's a survey handler right here. This is the last part we're going to look at. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna skip it. All what it what it does it takes a request. Let means you're gonna define just in this in this uh, inside the function these these values user agent language params and then we're gonna use them down here uh, when we insert them. You notice all is an associ of the all of the maps. So it's it's a map that I've created and passing it to JDBC insert. Um, the database is the first argument responses is the table, and all is the map of the values, and then it inserts. And then it returns the JSON that you saw. So that's it for that. So, okay, we're in, we're, we're in data analysis mode now. I'm gonna come in here and I'm just gonna evaluate these as if I was in the REPL. There's some keystroke commands where you can evaluate it, and you'll see it show up, you see the nil there. So I'm gonna require uh, these different Libraries. Okay, so just returns nil because there's nothing to return. Uh, I'm going to define this, which just gives me that's the query. I'm going to define the database. You see that. Then I'm going to call load table from responses, and there, there it is. Um, you're not really meant to see that, right? I mean, there's, there's no, we'll look at it better. 
So you can define the raw responses and then like so pull the data in into a data set and then continue to work with it, or or you can define a function and then every time we work with it, we can pull in the freshest data. In some cases that's a bad idea, but I'm just kind of demoing both ways. So in Cantor is the statistical library, and I can use the Java Swing library to, uh, to view our responses. There they are. Lots of, hey, everyone's interested in programmer stuff. That's weird. Um, yeah, so, so right here, I, if I call raw response, that's a value, but this is a function, so it's got to be wrapped. There's just no arguments going to the get responses function that I up above. So within Cantor, I've got a data set now, which, so I'm going to look at the column names. That's, in a, that's a vector of the column names. How many responses did we get? 103. Uh, so I'm using the, I'm, I'm calling the Cantor function end route. But if I want to just import the whole library and, and all of the functions that I can just call this, so I don't have to type in Cantor in front anymore. There's a response that's going out here and swing again. Uh, okay, so I can do some stuff with selectors. Let me just get the, uh, the column that people are interested in. Some stuff you do. So in Cantor's, that's this. This means give me only the columns from the data set that are in this vector. So I'm just choosing one. Or you can get the first row from that by passing the, uh, this, and I guess I can go. Two, two now. And what I'm trying to do is like, if, you, if you're used to working in R, I mean Python, you've got the access to the same kind of tools here. Uh, there's some of the values. So let's look at, uh, the values of like living in Utah versus not many people answered that question. Oh no, something. Um, so I'm going to define the value from Utah, which is a query. And I'm going to look at the number of rows. So there's 24 answered yes from Utah. Number of who answered no, 78. Let's see the number of conferences. Two, one. We'll get to something a little more interesting here in a second. So you can do stuff with a role, which is kind of like your group by. So 92 answered programmer stuff, two business, three tech support. Uh, we can look at the mean number of conferences. Let's see, okay, let's make a chart really quick. Okay, so there's our chart of our of our who we are, and you can you can add other stuff to the chart, but you can also define a function. So I'm going to take the user agent. I don't know if you saw the user agents right here in the, in the center from all of those. I can take the user agent and add it as a column to my data set. Uh, yeah, this add column. So now with device is a data set with the add, that column added on it. Now I'm going, to write, I'm going to write our data out to a CSV file. Okay, it's written out to the data responsive directory. And we're done with that. Let's do some MapReduce because we need it on 103. So Cascalog wraps around closures uh, are cascading. I'm going to bring in the evaluate the name in the namespace. And so you see this comment. Comment is a function. It means don't evaluate anything inside here. So I've just got it in there. That's why you see this string. Everything inside the comment function is not evaluated. So let's look. I'm going to go through every every file and print it out using uh, local the 
I do. The local version. There it is. It does spit it all out. We're not going to look at it like because that's that's not very useful. So let's uh, let's look at another function. I'm going to define a tap, which is an ID in cascading, which like it, it means hey, you're going to look for a CSV, and then these are the values in it. Here's uh, so what this is going to do. And there's some funky syntax in here, but they're just they're just functions. The uh, this means the question mark is the query, and the arrow is execute the query. So together, that's an macro to execute. And I'm going to standard out is where I want this to go. Then, uh, who's familiar with logic programming? Cascalog is built around data log. Um, I can't really go into explaining it right now, but what logic programming allows you to do is to specify kind of what you want and then use logic to figure it out and get it. So that's kind of a nice way to do a do. Uh, has anyone done, who's written any jobs before in Java or Pig or Hive? Okay, so you, if you have, you might see why this is interesting. So what this is going to do is it's going to select the fields and give us a count of the stuff you do. Okay, look, we've got the same numbers here. It's good we used Hadoop to do it instead of running just the closure look. Uh, we can look at uh, favorite buzzwords, disruptive technology, ooh, internet of things, leading the pack, that's awesome. So, uh, Anyway, I, I mostly just wanted to show you this because the power of closure that you can write this DSL and interact and, and run an average job, you see, I did break that, like, I'm not lying. Uh, that's pretty concise. If you can understand, once you understand the Cascalog syntax. So I have a function, or so I have a library that I've been using to We've only got a couple minutes, so I'll, I'll do this quick. So I wrote, this is just some user agent parsing stuff. Uh, it just takes a regular expression right here and says, hey, did it return anything? That's the sum function. And if it's, so it gives you true or false on all of these things. So what I'm going to do is call user agent slash platform so we can see what platform everyone is using. Oh, we need to be able to see it now. So it looks like 63 of these were submitted from Linux, 29 from Mac, 18 from other, 5 from Windows. That sounds funny here. The platform function actually doesn't take into account, um, it's, it's saying Android is Linux. So let's, let's dig into that a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to define a function that takes it and actually gets the device. Con is a function, it's just a conditional. The first is the, the test, and then if, if this is true, then I'm going to return Android. If the second one's true, I'm going to return iOS. And so it's a, it's a list of conditions and what you should return if they're, if they're true. And it just takes the first one. So did I evaluate that? All right. Then, so I'm going to get the device, and now you see right here I'm using the function user agent to device, and I'm passing the user agent into that, the result is going to be a device, and it's going to, the output into standard out is a tuple of device examples. I'm sorry I don't have time to explain all that, but you'll see it work. Okay, so 61 Android, that sounds better, right? Uh, 2 Linux, 16 iOS, 29 Mac, still 5 Windows. That looks a little bit better. Now you can see how this could be pretty compelling though, like I, I can use this that user agent library, I use it in the web app to store, I could, I could arguably do it before I store it, but if you need to go back, you can do it as well. Now, uh, we're gonna look at how you would do it in Clojure script. So, okay. This is the, the last demo, but I think it's the coolest part. Come on, give me. So I'm going to start up a closure REPL connected to my browser, and it's it's going to be compiling the closure closure script, and it'll we'll run JavaScript in the browser, but I'll be executing it in my local REPL. And you see, it's waiting for me to connect. If I just refresh this page, you'll see a REPL get created up here. Yeah. 
All right, so I know we need to we need to require the uh, hello world. Oh, sorry. No, I don't. I need to require my user agent um, library. That's what I need. Thanks for hanging in there. I know it's the end of the day. So, the world dot UA as UA. All right, so we got the browser over here on the right. I'm connected to it, and how you know that? Uh, let's look at how you would write some closure script. So I'm going to do a JS alert. So JS alert is the function, okay? And I'm going to take the UA and get the platform that it's on. I'm going to take I'm going to take the user agent that's in my Chrome browser here and call that function on JS Navigator. syntax to do the interop between them. It's alright. Copy and paste. Bam. So I just alerted my browser from the REPL running enclosure. Um, I was kind of asking, I, I think, I don't know if you can do that in Node. I'm so what this has is it's got a WebSocket connection and it's, that's how it's connected to the browser. But this is really interesting because you get the same interactive development that you do in Clojure when you're doing server applications, but you can still do the same thing in the browser too. Um, let's look at one more. Let's just look at my browser hype really quick. And I'm going to print this to the console. And you can see browser height is 407. It's pretty short. Yeah, but anyway, that's, that's, you gotta go. So thanks for sticking it out. I appreciate it. But I can take some questions or you're free to leave too if you need. But yeah, that's, that's cool.